Hello, and welcome to the third in a series of six presentations in the State Historic Preservation Office Shut the Door Barnes in Oklahoma series featuring Dr. Brad Bays, professor in the Oklahoma State University Geography Department. My name is Shay Otley, and I will be one of your moderators this evening. This presentation will be recorded and posted later for viewing. From 2009 to 2014, through a contract with the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office, Dr. Bays traveled the state of Oklahoma visiting every county looking at historic barns. Tonight, Dr. Bays will discuss the use of stone and bank barns in Oklahoma. If you have questions, please post them to the Q&A feature of the application, and Tiffany Dorado will share those with Dr. Bays at the end of this presentation. Please note that the public will not see the question until it is published by the moderator. If we do not get to your question by the end of the evening, we will provide the questions to Dr. Bays and we will get back to you with an answer. Thank you for attending and enjoy the presentation. Hi, everybody. Uh, tonight we're talking about uh, stone construction and as well as just masonry construction with other materials. So essentially what I want to do here is throw a, a really broad net and uh, provide you with some some photos of uh, different building materials and then we're going to get into the subject of bank barns toward the very end. Uh, I've got a lot of slides I'm going to go pretty quickly so um, uh, if you do have questions I would really appreciate those or comments too so um, please send those in to, uh, to Shay. I'll start off by uh, providing a little bit of a geological um, distribution map. I'm going to show you some materials that are that are local and we're going to start uh, when we look at the uh, the stone materials. We're going to start over here in the uh, in the panhandle in the high plains and look at some tertiary uh, sandstone from Cimarron County and then we're going to look at uh, some Permian sandstone from central part of Oklahoma, the, the, the reddish, orangish uh, sandstone. And then we'll move on to some Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania era uh, sandstone. And the Pennsylvania stuff is uh, really widely distributed, associated mostly with the sandstone hills throughout the eastern half of Oklahoma, really. We'll also look at uh, different types of limestone, some occurring up here in the northern part of the state, uh, some other limestone and other materials from the, uh, the Ozarks in the Northeast. Um, we'll also see some uh, granite materials and limestones from the Wichita Mountains area. And that, uh, that's about it. But before we go there, I want to talk a bit about, here are some the major uh, landforms that I'll be referring to. We'll find uh, certain interesting type of material that's used up here in Delaware County uh, in the Ozarks. Uh, we'll see uh, some interesting stuff associated with the Wichita's, actually a couple of different things associated with the Wichita's mountains. Um, now, this is a, uh, just a set of photos. I, I ripped them off Facebook from, you know, like 10 years ago. And Facebook is uh, a good tool for, for looking at architecture and kind of getting an idea. You can even find locations sometimes when people photograph these and put them on Facebook. I haven't had Facebook for years now, but um, this is a this is a type of bank barn that we'll be looking at toward the end. Uh, it's a, a what we would call a, a gable end bank barn. And it's notice that it's has a, a stone foundation. In this case, it's in the Ozarks. It's most, most likely a limestone. And uh, so that's that's what we'll see toward the end when we get into the structural stuff. To start, I wanted to say that the first uh, barn on the National Register in Oklahoma uh, is the, the Kimmel Barn, the Sam Kimmel Barn uh, near Covington, just to the west of Stillwater here in, uh, in Garfield County. And it's listed as a German bank barn. Uh, it's uh, Permian sandstone. Um, it's a gable end bank barn. It's hard to deter hard to tell that it's a bank barn at this point. But this is one of uh, uh, one of a growing list of barns that we're putting on the National Register with the help of State Historic Preservation Office. 
when State Historic Preservation Office is, is doing it. Okay, so the um, just to start off with what I've just called masonry construction, construction, we'll look at the most boring type first, and that would be cinder block. Now, cinder block, you know, is um, a, a ubiquitous type of stuff, but it's it's actually really common in milking parlors and what we might call milking barns. Um, this is one of um, many examples, hundreds of examples like this uh, across the state, mostly in central and western Oklahoma. Um, you find the most of them, but um, cinder block uh, construction it was one of those things that was required by the USDA back in the um, early the first half of the 20th century. And so it became kind of a standard use. All of these that I'm showing you are essentially milking parlors. There were milking parlors at one time, and you can see that they've been abandoned. Now, this is not a milking parlor. This is actually a poultry barn, but it's built out of um, uh, cinder blocks, abandoned poultry barn. Um, more milking stuff. This is actually a poultry barn, and uh, it's it's built out of cinder blocks, but it has a little stucco covering there, so it's hard to see that. All right, now getting to the more interesting stuff. Um, terracotta load-bearing tile is this orange block-like material. It has kind of a, um, a smooth surface and uh, rounded corners. And typically this is the stuff that you would see in the interior of walls of commercial buildings. So when you see a, a commercial building being torn down, often you'll see that see this stuff inside the brick veneer uh, that covered the building. And there is a strange concentration of buildings, barns and such uh, constructed with these, the, this terracotta load bearing tile. And it's one of the big questions I have for this, for this research project. Um, most of them are located uh, east of Oklahoma City in the Hera to Prague era, area, sort of a little zone there indicated by the uh, by the orange circle although they can the ones i'll show you here are found in other places so this is what the stuff looks like you've probably seen it before um there's this is a milking parlor again built out of this stuff and i don't have any really good explanation for it why it is so common in in certain parts of the state particularly that area around oklahoma city milking parlors primarily a little barn near Hera, and you can see this uh, the vertical or the ribs in in some of it um, you know people apparently it, it had to have been just some kind of cheap material perhaps it was um, made available after world war ii or something i'm not sure but it is really really common This is just a little farther out west. You can still see that. All right, this is probably the best example. And this is not in central Oklahoma. This is up near uh, uh, Big Cabin, I think Noah County, uh, northeast Oklahoma. And uh, this is like the best example of the use of terracotta uh, uh, load bearing uh, tile that I've ever seen. And it's a really neat dairy barn called the Keeney Dairy Barn. And uh, we've got this. Um, recorded. It's a pretty spectacular thing. Also, uh, you also see uh, silos, old silos that were constructed out of this material. This one is at a barn right outside of Woodward in northwest Oklahoma. You can see that the foundation of this bank barn is also, uh, also utilizes that terracotta load-bearing tile. All right, uh, there's another type of tile that, or another type of of construction material similar to that terracotta stuff that I found, um, and it's yellowish. And we find it in, in um, this, there are three barns that, just like this one um, in Western Oklahoma. <clears throat> um, I believe it's on Highway 51. Anyway, the this similar sort of block uh, has been used just a few other times that I've seen and uh, okay so this is a chain ranch this is a, a big large i think it's a hunting property or something now 
I'm going to be looking at some um, some components of the barn. Maybe I've mentioned it before. Uh, people refer to the the peak or the hay hood or the hay bonnet by different names. But this is a nice example of um, the the trolley, the hay trolley, being supported by the um, the hay bonnet. And that's essentially what this architectural feature on a barn is. It's just a structural um, um, support for a, um, a steel hay trolley that is intended to jut out at least five, 10 feet um, uh, from, the, uh, from the facade of the barn. You know, you'll see why that is important later. Here's another little um, uh, arched uh, roof barn with that same buff colored um, construction material similar to those um, load bearing tiles. Oh yeah, well, we've got to talk, believe it or not, there's permastone on some, but we won't, we won't count that. Um, one of the most impressive materials in barn construction that I've, that I saw during this five-year survey was in, mostly in southwestern Oklahoma. And I just bring it up because, um, we, you know, we're so familiar with, or we're so used to concrete everywhere, but in the old days, can you imagine uh, pouring concrete a little at a time, probably most, most likely by hand. And, and this is down in uh, uh, near the uh, Quartz Mountain area. And Kyle this is actually Kiowa County and in the wheat farming area. Um, lots and lots of sand and that, that sand and, and river rock was often utilized to produce a, a local concrete and that, that concrete was poured apparently by hand. You can see the, um, the layers of concrete uh, that were built up over time. This had to have been an, an enormous undertaking for, uh, uh, for a farmer. But there are a lot of these types of um, buildings and most of them tend to be granaries. Uh, some tend to be just entire barns. This is in the Wichita mountains. Um, lots and lots of concrete there poured. This is sort of an, uh, a uh, sort of a homemade cinder block. Um, it, it looks like it was uh, the, the blocks were poured and then, and then moved to the location. Another poured concrete um, building. And of course, these buildings aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So they're, they're here to stay for a while. Uh, one of the more, uh, more impressive uh, big feeder barns with a gigantic um, uh, hay bonnet, uh, sort of uh, enclosed hay bonnet. And here are the ruins of an, an enormous, must have been a dairy barn. Um, it's so big that I couldn't really get a very good shot of it, but that's all uh, hand poured concrete, hand mixed concrete, um, and and you know a little bit at a time. We find a few examples of stucco, and most of the stucco materials, although this is this is actually from um, northeastern Oklahoma, most of the stucco materials are found in northwestern Oklahoma, and some of that. Uh, material. Um, it, it's probably just a, uh, a covering of, uh, you know, of uh, a frame building, but it's there. Okay, now let's get into the stone construction or away from the man-made materials. The stone construction, uh, I'm going to begin with um, uh, the western, so the youngest sandstone that's used to, uh, for construction purposes in Oklahoma, and that's from the Panhandle. And this has sort of a gray buff color. Um, this is this is the probably I guess we could say the farthest western the, the farthest western barn in the state of Oklahoma that I can say. This is this is in Kenton, right outside of Kenton, uh, right on the New Mexico line practically, and uh, it's a just a sorry, we would call maybe a pole barn, but it's built out of this native sandstone uh, that's quarried just uh, locally. Not real impressive, it's big, but 
uh, you can see the the color of the of that local material. Local materials are really important, especially even today in places like Kenton, because Kenton's not close to really anything. And uh, um, so anyway, that's, um, you know, the local materials are what farmers typically used. Um, they were cheap, they were available, and that's generally what we would expect. And that's why geographers tend to like to study things like barns, because this is, this is these are buildings created uh, by people from the from the land, from whatever they had available, um, most most commonly, and then of course the railroads allowed lumber to come in, and um, things changed. But just an example here: uh, here's an, a smaller barn in the same general area, right around the um, uh, Black Mesa country. You even see a little terracotta load-bearing tile in there. A very uh, impressive bank barn, in this case, it's a, a gable end bank barn, happens to be on some of the flattest country in the state, in uh, the, the high plains of Cimarron County. And uh, this, is, this is one of the weird things about the barn study is that we find bank barns uh, in the flattest places and when, find very, very few bank barns in the hilliest places. So here's an example of a sandstone um, foundation in a uh, bank barn. And there, there on, the, on the right is uh, my field, uh, my field hand. He, he was um, with me on almost all of the surveys and um, we had a lot of great adventures together. All right, um, Permian sandstone. Red bed plains of central Oklahoma. Um, this is the stuff that is most familiar to uh, Okies like me from central Oklahoma, and it's uh, it's actually kind of an impressively um, colorful stone. Uh, this is uh, in uh, this is out west of Oklahoma City uh, in um, oh. I'm not going to remember remember real close. This is a an interesting little um, sandstone. I, I'm assuming it was some kind of uh, barn. It's in the middle of a field. Uh, it it uh, of course today looks like it's being used for um, a deer stand, but uh, this is a a very old building. I think the inscription was 1903, something like that, on one of the stones. I have a photograph of it, but. Uh, this is just between Stillwater and uh, Perry, and it's actually Noble County, I think, and um, probably was built by a uh, Czech uh, family, I'm guessing, maybe maybe German uh, group, but there's a nice arch in it. Uh, the positioning or the location of the building and most likely the farm, uh, the farmstead, is in the middle of the section at the, at the, at the uh, intersection of the four quarter sections that would have been, uh, would have been homesteaded. That's often a, that's a, that's a trait that's generally associated with people from Central Europe rather than Anglo-America. Another uh, 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 Permian sandstone, um, barn near Yale in eastern Payne County. And this is one that uh, we had on uh, uh, KFOR not long ago. This is the Auberly Barn. It's right off of um, um, Mulhall Road, uh, just on the west side of I-35. It's a, it's a real accessible barn. Unfortunately, you know, lots of people stop and have a look at it, but this is a fantastic barn. It was built in 1890, right after the land run, using uh, sandstone that was quarried about a quarter of a mile away down in a in a creek. Uh, and the uh, it's still in the um, still in still in the family. So this is a really interesting uh, barn with uh, a lot of history with it. Now we'll move on to Pennsylvania sandstone, which is not as 
attractive, I don't think. It, it's sort of, it varies a lot from sort of buff color to sort of a reddish brown. And it often has a lot of dark shades, I think, because of uh, sort of iron deposits or something like that. Um, so it's, you know, I'm not a geologist, obviously, but uh, it's, it's an interesting stone. Uh, this is one that probably many of you have seen. It's, it's probably the second or third most photographed barn in the state. Uh, it's the largest freestanding barn um, in the state of Oklahoma. At least that's what that's what the um, that's what most people say. Now, my field hand Luke and I found another dairy barn that's I think rivals this in size. Uh, may not be quite as big, but it's uh, it's close. This is a, a barn that is located on Highway 177 between Stillwater and Ponca City, uh, right. Uh, east of Red Rock, Oklahoma, near near Sooner Lake, just on the on the west side of Sooner Lake. A lot of people um, often re often ask me if I've ever seen this barn. I've, I've seen it hundreds of times because uh, I used to commute a lot between Stillwater and Ponca City to see family. The inside of this barn is um, um, something that probably few of you have ever seen, but uh, the thing burned right after it was built in the late 40s, you know, I, think it, I think it burned in the early 50s and it was rebuilt. Uh, it was basically a huge hay barn. And that's enough of that. This is a another Permian sandstone barn. This is located in Rogers County uh, near Claremore. And a lot of times the, uh, the builder, you know, would do interesting things like, you know, uh, make star patterns or whatever other types of patterns in the, in the building. So, Interesting little thing there. And then uh, way down in in uh, southeastern Oklahoma, you can still find Permian sandstone being used for things like crib barns. And this, you know, this qualifies as a side drive crib barn. And uh, it's been sheltering that truck for a while, I guess. But, uh, anyway, um, lots and lots of locally constructed buildings made out of this very common local sandstone. This is one, another uh, one from the Noble County area. It's probably, we could probably classify it as uh, Permian, if not Pennsylvania. This is a pretty commonly uh, seen barn right off of the uh, Cimarron Turnpike. So if you uh, are commuting between Tulsa and Oklahoma, or Tulsa and Stillwater, uh, this is one that's pretty easily spotted near Merrimack. Um, and another one uh, in Pawnee County with real common uh, Pennsylvania sandstone. You see that this one was constructed in 1944. And this barn, one of the largest barns I've surveyed, largest stone barns, is actually called the Wolverine um, uh, Wolverine Oil Company Drayage Barn, and it was a uh, it was a barn where horses and probably mules were housed during the uh, oil field development in um, in southeastern Osage County. So this is an Osage County barn that had a, a very specific history. It was it was. Um, it was important to keep lots of horses available in the early days of um, the Oklahoma uh, um, oil development, oil field development. Before there were roads, before there were uh, large trucks to move things around, you had to have teams of horses and mules. And this is a, a great example of a, a structure that represents that era. Uh, and, and, and that particular area area is, of course, um, you know, in the in one of the one of the several big oil fields of Osage County. Uh, it was in pretty lousy shape, unfortunately. This beautiful barn, and this is a uh, historical uh, photo that the owner showed me. You can go back to that. And so this photo was taken right in front of that. Part. You can even see some of the same patterns in the stone. 
uh, you see the, the very same thing. So uh, this was uh, from the, the 19 teens, 1920s. Uh, I think this photo was probably taken in the in the 30s, I guess. And oh, the other thing is this barn is no longer in existence. So it was torn down, oh, about five years ago, probably, um, unfortunately. And I did, uh, uh, we did get it recorded, so, but it's, it's long gone. This is uh, uh, another gable end bank barn made out of uh, what we could probably call Permian stone, but it's, it's sort of transitioning over to a type of um, uh, an area where we have a limestone that is often used in uh, building or in construction. This is this is in Washington County near Bartlesville, actually around Dewey. Uh, really impressive barn. This is a another Permian a Permian sandstone barn. Uh, uh, it's the Zinc Ranch barn. If you've ever been on the Cimarron Turnpike going. Um, on the west side of Tulsa, um, you'll see this uh, sign for the Zinc Ranch, and this is the this is the main barn building in that in that area. Now, the Silverdale limestone um, material is found in the northern tier counties of the state, essentially from if you drew a line from Bartlesville to Ponca City, uh, and included Newkirk, of, of course, um, you would be uh, uh, drawing a line through the Silverdale limestone area. It's a really pretty stone. Uh, this is the general area on the uh, on the map. Um, it's there's also, of course, uh, a, a lot of this is used in in the neighboring counties of Kansas. So it's it's a common construction material up there. This uh, beautiful. Um, a limestone barn is located just across the Arkansas River in Osage County, uh, just adjacent to Ponca City. And um, it's uh, it, it was actually used for uh, a magazine cover uh, for an, an, an ag magazine here in the state. This is a, just the other side of it. Nice arches and nicely constructed. Uh, this one uh, is also in the same general vicinity, uh, a little bit closer to Newkirk. <clears throat> and uh, but the the sizes of the of the cut stone just amaze me. Uh, this had to have been a um, a monumental undertaking. Uh, it it reminds me it, when I saw it, I thought, my gosh, this is kind of like you know seeing the the pyramids of Egypt because I can imagine cutting that stone and then hauling it uh, uh, probably uphill to wherever uh, they were building this thing. It would just take an enormous amount of work and, and skill to manipulate those, those stones. This is one of the, um, one of the real prizes of the survey up in the Silverdale stone area. It is a um, um, it's generally classified I think it I think it's a, there's a pretty good argument to call it a, a German ground barn or a Grundschier. Uh, I'm, I probably didn't pronounce that correctly but uh, it's a an ethnic form and it's when I showed this to uh, some barn scholars in um, from Pennsylvania they immediately said oh well, that's a Grundschier and a, and a ground a German ground barn and um, so, but it's located in Kay County, the, my home county where I, where I was born. So interesting, um, interesting architecture. And uh, I was just uh, elated when I, when I drove up and saw this. Another, um, another stone barn next to that one gigantic uh, block barn that we saw earlier. And there are limestone barns around the state and other places. There, there are limestone outcrops in the Wichita Mountains, which you know generally associate with granite. Uh, but there are there is some limestone area, um, and this is in the limestone area. So the local uh, local materials being used, and uh, some sandstone kind of in the same area. 
one of the more spectacular barns comes from uh, Ottawa County uh, up near um, Miami. And <clears throat> this is a, uh, a barn that was built uh, by a, a lawyer, apparently, back right before the Great Depression hit. And, and when the Depression hit, uh, he, he lost it. But the family who purchased it have held on to it ever since. And this is a fantastic um, example of uh, uh, use of limestone and sandstone uh, in, in a barn in Oklahoma. One of the weirdest materials that I've ever run across uh, was, uh, and I, I don't have a right name, I don't know the name for it, but I just call it rubble rubble work or river rubble work, or um, I think some people call it uh, chert, or chert rock, but this is found in a small area in the Ozarks of Oklahoma, probably is found also in Arkansas, I'm sure, um, generally around Delaware County, maybe some parts of Adair County and Cherokee County, but it's, it's all very, very close together. And you see the, the use of this more than likely field stone material um, amassed to create a, a rock veneer. And <clears throat> it's, it's just, you know, uh, the size of the stones are relatively small, it's usually usually this size or smaller, um, just mortared together, and it gives it kind of an interesting look. This is a, a barn that uh, is, I think it was being converted into a house, believe it or not. So, um, and then this is a dairy barn that is pretty rock solid, not going anywhere anytime soon. The inside is, uh, has a ton of poured, a whole lot of poured concrete, many tons of poured concrete. Fireproof barn if there ever was one. Sometimes you get mixes of materials. This is actually uh, from central Oklahoma. It's not up there in the Northeast, but you have a mix of, uh, looks like sort of river rock. And then of course the um, terracotta, low bearing tile and um, apparently some some sandstone now gypsum i never thought would be a building material for a barn who would who would build anything out of gypsum it's soft it's water soluble but if it's the only thing you have sometimes people use it and this is it may look like sandstone but it's basically gypsum rock um, which uh, you can tell it, it, that's a, not a very good photo, but if you get up close, you can see that this is sandstone with with a lot of um, you know gypsum component to it, and so it it tends to melt together, and and of course it erodes very easily. So um, not a great example of something that you probably want to build a build a foundation with. Now, one of the most unique looking building materials is the granite cobblestone. Probably a lot of you have known, have seen this if you've ever gone to Medicine Park. Um, this is what Medicine Park is known for. Uh, but this is down in the Wichita Mountains in the granite area. And granite cobblestones were found all throughout this area between, um, or this is the, just the Wichita Mountains uh, Wildlife Refuge. This is where most of these things were, or most of these uh, buildings are located and uh, really, really unique. The some people refer to it as cannonball construction, um, but this is a uh, really interesting building material. This happens to be probably the most substantial chicken house that you will ever see in your life. Roofs may be gone, but the, the walls are going to be there for a while. Just sort of a pole barn made out of that same stuff. Actually, some houses built out of this scattered around the Wichita's. Okay, now for some academic material. Um, in general, we're going to we're going to look at 
uh, forms of barns now and essentially bank barns. Whether it's the, the use of stone or whether it's the form of, of a barn in, uh, in geography and um, uh, I guess you could probably say folklore studies, um, there are <clears throat> uh, what I consider to be a couple of schools of thought when it comes to understanding or explaining patterns of settlement. And the first of these is what I will call, and, and these are all my terms here, ethnic migration, cultural diffusion. And th this is a school of thought that um, people who generally are associated with it call themselves cultural geographers or maybe historical cultural geographers. These include scholars such as Alan Noble, uh, Hubert Wilhelm, and Terry G. Jordan. And all of those folks um, generally follow, or especially Jordan, would follow after uh, Fred B. Niffen, who was uh, sort of a pioneer in mapping of uh, uh, house forms, particularly folk housing, vernacular housing, if you will. And uh, Louisiana State University was the, the location where that sort of school of thought developed during the 20th century under Fred Niffen. Um, there's another approach, though, and that is sort of the sort of the critique of the um, the cultural geographers, and these are basically the uh, who I might call more of the more of the economic geographers or historical agricultural geographers. Um, um, both of these fellows, uh, John Fraser Hart, John Hudson, uh, both are. Uh, they consider themselves maybe agricultural for sure, um, regional perhaps, uh, but they they have a different, generally different take on what you on on what you should expect to find in a place. So let's go into those just a little bit. On the the, the first school of thought, the ethnic migration cultural diffusion group, they believe that um, it's worthwhile to to examine in the field um, folk buildings, barns, outbuildings, houses, folk houses, whatever, in order to begin to see patterns, uh, to begin to see or identify things and classify forms so that those forms might be traced back to uh, earlier source regions. Maybe that's in the along the Atlantic seaboard or, or east of the Appalachians, or perhaps back to, um, back to Europe, uh, either the British Isles or Central Europe or Scandinavia. So the, these are um, traditions that have been, uh, or this is a sort of an approach that's been uh, expanded on. Um, uh, there, are, there are journals, there are organizations that for the most part, associate, you know, are associated with this school of thought. Um, they tend to want to find what are called diagnostic traits representative of a particular building tradition, not a style, but just a tradition, a folk, folk cultural tradition. So their axioms, their, their premises are, first of all, rural people tend to be conservative. They don't change what they do very often. Innovations, real innovations are very, very rare. And because of that, everywhere we see diffusion, every, everywhere is generally the, you know, all, the, the cultural landscape is, is basically the product of diffusion over time. If diffusion is expansion uh, of, of traits as people migrate, a mixing of ideas and you know, not very, not very often do we have actual innovation. On the other side, the Hart and Hudson side, the economic rationality assimilation school, they don't really buy into the idea that, uh, particularly when it comes to agricultural settlement, they don't really think that ethnic patterns are that um, 
uh, capable of surviving. Uh, they do sometimes, particularly if there are groups of people of the same, uh, you know, from the same source area, and they settle together. Maybe that's that's possible for them to transplant another tradition or, or building tradition into an area. Um, and they, uh, this school of thought tends to sort of um, accuse sometimes the, uh, the other ethnic migration cultural diffusion folks of maybe perceiving things and giving meaning to what they see uh, when there's maybe not any actual real solid evidence of it. In other words, they may have a priori types of um, uh, approaches. And this was one of the things that I was really, really concerned about when I began this study. I didn't want to see things that I wanted to see. And, and, and I think I, I started off that way. I, I, began to, I began to think, okay, well, this might be an, you know, an ethnic trait of, of something. And after a, after a time, I'm, I began to lean more toward this economic rationality approach. And, and, and this, the axioms of this school of thought are, number one, farmers are conservative. We know that. Um, however, successful farmers are also rational, and they, they work hard to minimize risk. They can do that in a number of ways. But if it comes to immigrating to a new land, starting to farm in a completely new environment, um, a new continent, perhaps, or at least a new region, then this school of thought tends to state, well, it makes more sense for, for immigrant people to conform. That is to, um, you know, if they're going to be successful, they can't take risks. And in general, farmers are not nostalgic. They, they will uh, do what is necessary um, they're utilitarian um, because they're always looking to do something, and that is, you know, to to be successful farmer. To if they're in, you know, in the commercial, um, if, if they're commercial farmers, then most certainly they're going to do the very best to maximize their return uh, and and minimize their economic risk. So these are the the two sort of approaches to you know different things two different ways of seeing things. Um, and so what about the Oklahoma case? Um, what I got from that was, okay, number one, if you take the, the history of Oklahoma settlement, then I wouldn't really expect to find much evidence at all of European ethnic settlement for a number of reasons. First of all, if you go to the, the census data, from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, you'll find that there really weren't very many foreign-born um, people in the state of Oklahoma when you, you know, compared to other states, uh, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, uh, the Dakotas for sure, anywhere in the Midwest. Oklahoma just didn't receive nearly as many foreign-born immigrants. And those, those who were foreign-born often went to the, uh, the urban areas anyway. Um, the settlement process of Oklahoma, which was fairly unique, the, the land runs in particular, or the land lotteries, also worked against the idea, or worked against the possibility of ethnic islands developing. So uh, the land runs, you know, unless there were highly coordinated groups of people, most of the time you had a, a blender effect taking place in in the unassigned lands and the Cherokee outlet and the opened uh, the the uh, surplus land openings of the Indian um, reservations in the western part of the state, those um, you know didn't really allow for patterns of of people with the same religion or the same uh, ethnicity to uh, to establish concentrations. There are only a few examples that where that happened. And the only, the only real cohesive European ethno-religious groups also arrived much later than the land run. So they were, they were um, 
sort of added well over a decade later. Um, uh, that includes the Mennonite groups. That is, we have about four primary areas of the state that were uh, either Old Order Amish or another version of Amish or Mennonite. Um, and, and those areas have some continuity, some cohesiveness, particularly the Old Order Amish areas. We also received some checks into central Oklahoma, into this area of Oklahoma, uh, and of course around um, Canadian County, southern, the southeastern corner of Lincoln County, where Prague is located. Now, those people, those checks generally came from Nebraska and Kansas and the Dakotas, and they were second and third generation ethnic Czechs. So even though they established a local ethnic flavor, they were not really fresh off the boat, as they say. So um, they didn't necessarily, they, they weren't, they were experienced with farming in the Great Plains. The only possible uh, area that where you might find um, uh, cohesive groups of people from the same area might be those areas of the Volga Dutch. And, and those people um, uh, were scattered about the state. They arrived fairly late, sometimes right before World War I, um, in places like Shattuck in Ellis County, um, a few other areas. But um, what I could tell is I was looking hard for um, any signs of ethnic patterns. And I don't think I found very much. You might you might disagree with the, some of the materials that I'll show you here, though. So, so um, just to uh, sort of summarize, um, we have land runs in the, you know, in the western, the central and the western part of the state. We have um, the opening of, of Indian territory later than the land runs. And that's primarily, there, there's essentially no land to be open because they are, the land is all allotted. So to summarize, which is, which is it? Migration, tradition, diffusion, or rationality and assimilation? Well, there's an, an interesting innovation that occurs between the, um, uh, the opening of the, the land runs let's say 1889, 18, early 1890s, and about 1900. And that is the rope and pulley hay trolley. The rope and pulley hay trolley was an innovation that allowed the loading of loose hay into a hay mow. And this was pretty much a standard uh, piece of equipment on a barn by about 1900. What it did was it allowed um, using a, uh, a hay fork is what you see there in the center part of the screen. Um, the hay fork or uh, the hay fork was tied to a, or was connected to a, a trolley system, which basically paralleled the, the ridge line of the barn. Uh, and, and that's the thing that was jutting out on the, from the hay hood on that barn I showed you earlier. Now, what this did was it, it made two level frame barns that you could construct with, you know, with a balloon frame uh, method of, of construction, made them more or less as efficient as a bank barn. Now, a bank barn is nice because you can uh, you can load hay into the the middle level and then feed cattle or feed livestock by dropping hay through a chute to the to the basement of the barn, which is on the lower um, which is lower on on the uh, on the slope. This is the what this is the uh, the way the uh, hay trolley system worked. This is actually a painting that uh, one of the landowners gave me uh, or let me photograph uh, of his barn back in the old days. And uh, you could essentially uh, grab hold of large um, wads of uh, loose hay and then drop them into the hay mow. You could even move the thing around using a system of pulleys connected to a team of horses. So. Considering that, if rationality assimilate, if that if that hypothesis about you know rationality assimilation is is valid, if that's the one that I I thought you know would work, then you would kind of expect 
bank barns to be pretty much absent in Oklahoma Territory, which was open basically 1889 to 1893. And you might find bank barns in Indian Territory because it's a mu it's much earlier settled. And uh, of course, it's hillier. I always thought, OK, you'll probably find bank barns in hilly areas where it's easy to find a good slope. But and here's the difference between the, the, the line between Indian Territory on the right and Oklahoma Territory on the left. Um, my hypothesis was just about opposite of what the empirical reality showed. Indian Territory has very, very few bank barns. I showed you one example at the beginning of this talk. If you want to find bank barns in Oklahoma, you go to Oklahoma Territory. You go to Western Oklahoma and Central Oklahoma. So let's look at some bank barns. There are a couple of types. I mean, there are many types of bank barns. If you uh, if you adhere to uh, some of the literature, such as the Alan Noble Wilhelm and Eugene Wilhelm uh, <coughs> Huber Wilhelm book, uh, there are lots and lots of different types of bank barns. And out here, I'm not going to go into dividing up barns into different subclasses and such. We don't need to do that. But Gable and bank barns are almost all located in north central and northwestern Oklahoma. Forget southwestern Oklahoma uh, or southern Oklahoma. They use local stone very commonly. And I think this might have some connection to central European, at least uh, people with a with a tradition that might come out of central Europe. Basically, um, I'm talking about the German speaking lands of Europe. I think maybe that uh, the source, probably the best source, the most likely source is uh, our German families who move, move to northern Oklahoma uh, with the land runs, and especially the Cherokee Outlet, from Missouri, and per perhaps the lower Missouri Valley, where there was a strong uh, German uh, settlement component during the 19th century. There's also the possibility that Germans from Russia coming from Nebraska and Kansas, mostly, and in some cases like Shattuck, directly from, uh, from the mother country, um, might have brought other building traditions that we would see here. Uh-oh. Let's see if I can do that right again. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay. So... And here's an anomaly. So this is a this is a, a Gable Inn bank barn that is found in the Cherokee Ozarks. This one was built in 1954, and it's a good example of a bank barn that was constructed mostly on a slope because um, it, was, it was pretty isolated. It's pretty isolated from railroads or anything like that. So this is an exception. What you generally find are Gable Inn bank barns like this. This happens to be in K County, uh, around in the Silverdale limestone area. Another great example of a Silverdale stone Gable Inn bank barn. As you can notice, the, a wagon could easily go, um, could enter the barn on the Gable End and drop hay uh, or store hay there, or maybe put it up into, the, uh, into a hay mow above, but then drop feed and hay um, fodder uh, to uh, the basement part where perhaps dairy cattle were, um, were sheltered. Here's another one from Payne County. Um, uh, and then you have a little uh, milk house added on to uh, onto this one. So more than likely a dairy barn. More from Western Oklahoma. And I'm going to have to speed through this a little bit. Uh, this one uh, is an interesting uh, Gable Inn bank barn with, it looked like it had a, uh, uh, an embankment, uh, sort of a, uh, a little bridge that went into it. And move on here. We've seen the one from way out west. One of the most unusual barns I've ever, I've ever seen is this thing. It has, a, uh, it has two gable end entrances with, um, with embankments or berms constructed to allow entry to the, to the barn. The other end of it. A lot of the, of course, the soils are eroded away from it, so you don't really see 
uh, how, how complex that was. Eve side bank barns are, are pretty rare. We tend to find them mostly associated with the Amish populations or at least the Mennonite groups. Uh, most of those Mennonite groups were uh, originated in, in Ohio, uh, Holmes County, Ohio, I believe, mostly. And, and we find um, these located really in two places. There's a, a cluster in eastern Custer and Washita County along the line between Custer and Washita County in the west. And, of course, southwestern Mays County around the Choteau and Maysie area, famous Amish areas. Um, this is not uh, this is not an Amish barn. This is actually up in the Silverdale area. But this was a side entry uh, or excuse me, an eave side bank barn. You might not recognize it. And I didn't certainly until the, the property owner showed me the painting of the barn before the tornado hit it. And it looks like that. Another eave side bank barn um, with a Gothic roof with a, uh, an entry to the side. This is an eave side bank barn. Probably the, the most complex one is located actually in a suburb of Oklahoma City. And uh, if this one's still standing, I think it, it was in the path of at least one tornado in the last 10 years. Um, but it was, it was constructed, it was reconstructed into a wedding barn. Um, which ha happens to be the fate of, of some barns. Um, and you can see a, an actual ramp, uh, an old ramp constructed into this barn, which is really unusual for Oklahoma. Some other Gable in, or excuse me, Eve side bank barns uh, located around, around the state. This happens to be just north of Stillwater up in Pawnee County. Interesting one. Uh, this is the first bank barn uh, we ever discovered, and my son was riding. Uh, he, he was he was on the field trip with me, and um, he spotted this barn. And uh, so, so all the credit for the bank barns go to Luke. And uh, <laughs> this this was one of the coolest barns actually that ever ever found. And this was actually in southwestern Oklahoma, so you can't really see the embankment on it, but uh, it's sort of transverse. You go in one side, and then um, and there's an uh, and exit through the gable end. Other examples of uh, eave side bank barns uh, around mostly in western Oklahoma in the uh, in the Amish, generally Amish area. We saw this one already. Some are more um, modest than others, I suppose. Mostly in ruins now. And that's about all the time that I have. I'll end with this one. Um, it's a, a an Eveside Bank barn that is very similar to what you might find in Holmes County. Uh, I believe it's Holmes County, Ohio. Um, and this happens to be uh, smack dab in the center of the um, the, the Mays County, the southwestern corner of Mays County, which is the oldest old order Amish uh, settlement in the state. And my lights just went out in my building, so it must be seven o'clock and time to stop. So, uh, any questions? Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Brad, can you hear me okay? Yes. There are just a few questions in our Q&A. Uh, the first question that we have comes from Dorothy Poole, and she asks, how many other folks are involved in barn study in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, there, there, we actually, ha there's a, uh, an organization called uh, the International Society for Landscape, Place, and Material Culture, uh, used to be known as the Pioneer America Society, and they have an annual meeting, and they have a uh, they have a journal and a newsletter, um, a, a quarterly journal. Uh, so there are actually uh, people who do academic publishing on this subject, and it's not necessarily Barnes, but I'm referring to uh, uh, folk architecture, vernacular architecture, um, landscape. Uh, cultural landscape uh, in general. But yeah, there, there's, there's actually a, an organization called the National Barn Alliance, the NBA. And there may even be some people listening who are, 
who are part of that organization, they are they are the ones to to talk to about um, um, anything having to do with barns in particular. So the National Barn Alliance. So there are, I, I would say, you know, I, I would say that uh, um, there are a lot of people studying barns. Now, I can also say that with some certainty, I believe, as far as a state the size of Oklahoma goes, I don't think there are any other states that have have ever done a comprehensive survey of historical barns um, to the to the extent that the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office has done it. So this was a this was really kind of a, a unique project, but I wish other states would go through it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dorothy has another question. Um, why were cinder blocks required by the government? Well, I you know I can't really answer that, but um, the United, the USDA came out with all sorts of rules and regulations after uh, an event when um, a lot of people died because of um, uh, diseased you know diseases associated with milk and and. Uh, I can't give you the names of the diseases so much, but you're probably familiar with that. And the USDA had some weird regulations. They, they required the addition of what were called milk houses to existing barns. So if a, if a dairy wanted to maintain, excuse me, if a dairy wanted what was called grade A status, a grade A dairy, they had to have all of these government regulations. And that included uh, a concrete floor throughout the milking area. Um, you had to have a separate milk house where the uh, where the milk cans were uh, were washed and sterilized. Uh, you had to have running water, I believe. Um, and one of the strangest ones was the USDA required barns, dairy barns, grade A dairy barns, to be painted white. Not sure why. Interesting. All right. And uh, just a couple more. Jim Rao had a question early on. Uh, he sees that you're from Ponca City. He wants to well, know. I grew if... up in Stillwater. I actually grew up in Stillwater. I was born in Ponca City and moved on my second birthday to Mississippi. Oh, so, <laughs> so not long. But you've but spent I, a lot I, of time I, up there, obviously. Yeah. Uh, he wants to know if uh, you've been up there lately to see the stone barn that they're fixing across from the bowling alley on Lake Road. No, I'm not else. familiar with that. I know where Lake Road is, though. All right. Maybe something that would be interesting. And then we have one last question from, it looks like, Donald Trow, and I apologize if I say that name incorrectly. Um, Who? It, Donald, and it's T R U A X. So I could be saying it. Oh, that's Don. Yeah, Donald's with the National Barn Alliance. Oh, lovely. Okay. Yeah. So he asks uh, one of the Permian sandstone barns had the lower part in a light brown, and the upper part was in a reddish color. How did that happen? He wants to know. <laughs> You know, that's one of the funny things. Log construction gives you the same problems. You know, you, uh, we geographers, want, we want to classify everything and we want to fit things in neat little boxes. But one of the issues with log construction is you'll say, OK, well, this is a this is a house or this is an outbuilding constructed with V notching. But you might have V notching and you might have saddle notching. You might have different types of saddle notching. Certainly, you're going to have, uh, you know, different types of materials because perhaps maybe they ran out or maybe the thing, um, you know, needed repair. Um, one of the interesting facets of mixing materials, however, is associated with check uh, construction. Uh, there is there's actually in some of the literature, the literature in the cultural diffusion school that refer to a check barn and that's the, that's what they call it a check barn and it is uh, its diagnostic traits 
are the use of like three different types of materials, usually stone, usually brick, and maybe stucco or something like that. So uh, if that's a diagnostic trait, then, you know, I think maybe we'd see check barns in Prague uh, in Lincoln County in the in the check area. Um, I, I made that assertion on a report. Um, it's a possibility. I don't have good proof of it, but it seems to be a, you know, a pattern that you can see there. I, but again, I'm kind of leery about saying that's a check barn for sure. So I, I probably didn't answer your, your question, Dom, but you can email me. <laughs> He's got your email. <laughs> yeah. Great. And there is one last question that Patty Harris has uh, snuck in here. It says, will there eventually be a publication, perhaps a book, about these different historical barns in Oklahoma that you know of? My department head really wants me to do that. So <laughs> I'm in the process. And uh, uh, hopefully hopefully you'll see some articles coming out, um, probably in the journal Material Culture, uh, and, and eventually a book. So... I owe it to a lot of people, so I need to get it get it done. It sounds like it's in demand <laughs> from all areas. Well, we really everybody do loves barns. Barns are like puppies. <laughs> Everyone you know? wants one, right? Everybody likes puppies. <laughs> um, now, until you if you own a puppy and you own a barn, see a lot of barns are in trouble because they're liabilities, and so you know they look cute or they look neat. And they're fun to look at and people drive around the county roads looking at barns uh, for fun and photographing barns for fun but uh, maintaining a barn is a different story i'm glad i don't own any barns yeah they seem like they would be a lot of work for sure yeah well we appreciate it that's that's the last question that we have in our q a i'll hand it over to shay unless you have any closing remarks I'm looking forward to our next talk. All right. Thank, thank you, you Brad. We thank everyone for attending our third Shut the Door Barnes in Oklahoma presentation. And we hope you'll sign up for the fourth presentation, Signs of Ethnicity and Adaptation in Oklahoma Barnes. That will be held on August 30th at 6 p.m. We hope to see you there. Have a great evening. <laughs>